Yeah. Yes, we're ready. Okay. So anytime you're ready, go ahead and go. I'm Viji. I'm Miko. And you're listening to... No, no, no. No? Wait, wait. I'm... Room, room, rear. No. <laughs> wait, okay, you go again. Go again. I'm Viji. I'm Miko. Perfect. From Love All 5D. Yeah, we're from Love All 5D. You're listening to Room Room Veer with Jeff Smith. Uh, that was awesome. See, there should always be two people on the show every, uh, every, <laughs> all the time. And, and, and having fun and loving it. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to hit stop. I'll be right back. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith, where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to Vroom Vroom Veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. Do Ford, thank you so much for being on Vroom Vroom Veer and welcome to the show. How's it going? Good, Jeff. How are you, man? I am doing great. I'm having a good day. I'm going to get an oil change in a couple of hours and that makes <laughs> me happy. <laughs> so you are at thebrandleader.com. So talk a little bit about what you're most excited about in your business today. Gosh, I, I have the wonderful privilege of helping businesses, brands, CEOs, executives, help craft meaningful brands um, and, and kind of introduce them to the public. So um, I, yeah, I take brands really seriously um, because I think they're so intimate and, you know, if you define a brand as like the emotional connection between a a consumer and it's, you know, a product service or business um, you can really realize that there's something really powerful there. And so we have, I, I say it's a privilege because it really is, you know, you get a chance to, and a wonderful team with me to work with people and understand what makes them tick and what their values are, how they want to present themselves, what kind of products they have. And uh, yeah, we build brands. It's an awesome experience. I'm very lucky. It sounds like you're having fun. <laughs> probably, you know, I turned 47 here in a couple of months and this is probably the most fun I've ever had in my life. It's, it's an um, unbelievable time right now. Yeah. And I, I don't know if your branding, um, business is cause I hired some branding people to do come up with a show concept basically. Okay. And it was like six months, six weeks of therapy for me. So uh, you're a little bit therapist. You're a little bit like designer. You're a little bit like business whisperer. It's a, it's an interesting skill set, the brand person, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. No, you can say that, you know what, we had a, we had a great call yesterday with one of our clients in Italy Mm -hmm. and um, they're working with a product design firm in the Netherlands. They have a consultant in Germany. And so I'm sitting here, our senior copywriter, we got our accounts manager, project manager, creative director, myself, we're all on this call. And I literally looked at Rich, who's our senior copywriter, sitting next to me. And I looked at him and I'm just like, man, how lucky are we? Like, this is yeah. this is awesome. And then you're right. It, it is part therapist. It is part listener. It's part best friend. It's part right. prin- principal. I mean, it is, you get a chance to, if people are honest with themselves, people are honest with their brand, you have an, an opportunity to really delve deep into what makes people tick and what makes businesses tick. And it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's, it, it can be, it can be long. Typically our process is, for, you know, we say a full rebrand, uh, not to diminish any experience you had uh, to create your show, um, but you know, we might spend six weeks just coming up with a, a vision statement. Uh, sure. So sure. typically our process is we say eight to 12 months for a full rebrand, wow. uh, tip, tip yeah. to tail. Yeah. And that's everything from a name or a rename all the way down to launching it with a website and things. So a lot of that is development time and things. Um, right. Yeah, it's a really, really fun. Uh, and like I said, I'm really blessed to have some great people around me who are much smarter than I am. Okay, so we're going to get into teasing some of the stories that we're going to talk about. Uh, okay. We want to talk about how you ended up on Johnny Cash's tour bus. <laughs> that's a that's one of my, <laughs> I have got a poster of him right next to me. There's a really funny story there. It's actually very sweet as well. I can't wait because I love Johnny Cash. <laughs> Good. I'm sorry. He's, he's Good. Well, then you will be anymore. very excited. Listen, if you're listening right now, you're going to want to stay tuned because this is probably the most interesting uh, way that anyone has finagled their way onto a tour bus of an icon. It'll there be great. Go. I promise you it'll be great. And you are a fan of IPA 
and we've yeah. already figured out yeah. you like West Coast. So me too. Great. Yeah, we can talk about mosaic hops and Cascadia we hops. We'll learn out about IPA in the future. But let's yeah. start at a uh, childhood story. So where did you grow up? You know, I grew up. Uh, 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 <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna pause for. I usually say Philadelphia. I'm gonna be honest. Today. I'm gonna be very honest. As it kind of moved, and we'll talk a little bit about how my life has changed, what my veer was, um, okay. and part of that is being authentic and and so forth. And so I'll I'll, I'll be honest with you because you're probably the first person to ask me this in a number of years. Um, I grew up in a town called Allentown, Pennsylvania, about okay. 45 minutes northwest of Philly. Uh, something I was actually very ashamed of growing up because it's kind of a you know it's it's a suburb of Bethlehem, so it's the suburb of the old steel town. Okay. Um, we grew up you know really poor, had no money. And wow. okay. um, I, my first chance I got, I, I hightailed it out of there. And so I bolted when I was 18 and, and moved to Colorado and uh, didn't really look back. So, um, but yeah, I think I can look back now, you know, almost 30 years later and say that there's, there's some good memories of Allentown and yeah, that's where I'm from. Yeah. You know, there's, uh, I wanted to leave because <laughs> I grew up in a small town in Michigan, you know? Okay small town in Michigan that no one's ever heard of. Now, I wouldn't classify my uh, existence as a kid as dirt poor, but definitely, you know, I didn't get all the Christmas presents, right? Yeah. So there was, you know, there's a disparity where some friends, they got everything they asked for. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't that kid. You know, it took me, it took me a while to realize right. that we actually had, one thing I can say is, and, and my, my mother is a lot of things, but one of the things I can say is that she for whatever reason, thought that that was the most important thing. She would have spent everything she had and stuff she didn't to make sure that when we woke up on Christmas Day, you know, we didn't have um, we didn't have a, a dad around. And so right. my brother, right. sister, and I woke up. We always had presents on Christmas morning. They were always more than we expected. So one thing I can say uh, fondly about those times was definitely there was there was something there that was, uh, you know, we were not for want on Christmas morning. Well, good for mom. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. that is a huge deal for kids. You know, it's yeah, it's, yeah. I don't think I appreciated it until I had children of my own, and right. and you know what the power of, of Christmas is, but um, and why she she made a lot of sacrifices for us. So uh, which I don't always give her, you know, public credit for, or even private credit for. So we'll do that now. Right, there you go. Thanks, mom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so you escaped when you were eighteen. I did something similar. Uh, I joined the Air Force when I was eighteen. Oh, thanks. Thank you for serving. Hey, it was it was a blast. It was mostly wings and beer on the beach. So it was all good. I have no complaints about my military yeah. service. Sounds, it was great. mostly fun. Um, but uh, I wanted to definitely, it was mostly for me, it was the snow. Um, I don't know what Allentown's like, but in Menominee, mm -hmm. Michigan, it's just way too much damn snow. I mean, from yeah. like November to May, it's just like... I got to get out of here. <laughs> so that's yeah, that. how did you escape when you were 18? Did you go to college? Did you join the military? Did you get on a merchant Marine ship? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I wish I was maybe some of those things a little bit more brave than I am. So thanks for serving that. First of all, my dad was in the military. He was in the Marines and, uh, and I just never, uh, he was actually dishonorably discharged, but I was never, um, uh, never one to follow suit like that. Uh, no, I got out because I just, I can't even explain why I just felt there was something holding me back. Right. Um, I always just felt, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say like I was destined for anything or greatness. And I just knew that I just, I was more of a city guy and I just wanted to explore. Right. Um, and right. I'd never really been out of that area. And when, when I was 18, I actually um, went to Colorado for the first time and I decided to move out there. Okay. So wow. uh, yeah, I, I just moved out there for the summer, had a great time and decided that was going to be my home. So I moved to Boulder uh, shortly after that, when I was 19, uh, and, and just kind of never looked back really. My, wow. my brother, my brother was living overseas at the time. My sister had moved to Philadelphia and my mom shortly after that moved to uh, Hilton head, South Carolina. So there was no reason to go back. So when I left, I was home. Was all, gone. And, and, home yeah, was I was gone. Right. I, home was gone. There was no home. And so home became where I was or where my family, where my, my new family was. And, and that was it. So, yeah. So I, I, I still to this day, I can't remember the last time I was back there. So no college for you then? I went to Kutztown University in um, in Pennsylvania, just outside of where I was for for a hot minute, and I transferred out to University of Colorado Boulder. Where oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so you I were was going there. To school. For, yeah, gotcha. I was. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't finish. I'm a few credits shy of finishing, but at this point, you yeah. Know, why? That's not gonna happen. <laughs> so basically, you started going to college, and then you decided to enroll in hard knocks, basically. 
Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. I, I did something similar. So I um, I took a class, you know, sort of like a class here, a class there for 20 mm-hmm. years. And then when I retired from the Air Force, I finished a, a bachelor's degree in psychology. Oh, good for you. Well, it, I, I mostly did it just to get money because they were giving away money to, to do that. So yeah. if I yeah. if I went to college, then I could screw around. So it was awesome. I screwed around for like three years and got well, paid to screw If you can around. do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can't stand still. I, you know, I'm a... I'm an Enneagram three. I typically, I need to be doing something. I need to accomplish things. And so I could just never slow down. So for me, it was wow. just going from one thing to another. Right. Um, if it wasn't school, it was work. If it wasn't work, it was starting my own business. If it wasn't that, it was learning from somebody else and so forth. And that's, I mean, it just never, it doesn't, it's today. It's it's not even, it hasn't stopped. I've learned to curtail it a little bit, but um, for me, I just, I love to just absorb and try different things. So what was the, what was sort of like your job <clears throat> after you, stopped going to school there in where were you boulder i was in boulder yeah right. and i ended up uh i you know chased a girl up to um mm-hmm. got by gosh by now i'm like 22 23 right uh up to minneapolis and so i was there Whoa. talk about snow um Yikes. and and so i was up there for a couple of years and when i was there I, you know, I didn't really know what i was i knew i wanted to do something i didn't know what it was actually this is you know, an interesting story because um, what I first started doing was I just worked in a coffee shop. I've just always loved coffee. I've always loved that kind of coffee shop experience. You seem like you a know, coffee guy. Coffee and yeah, beer. I'm actually, is, yeah, it's like yeah, coffee and beer, and that's all it right, is. Right. right. Coffee in the morning, beer in the evening. That's nectar that's nectar correct. of the gods. <laughs> correct. It's yeah. something about bitterness. <laughs> yeah, you know, actually that's I didn't even put that together, but you're absolutely right. That's yeah. probably what it is. Okay. So yeah. Um, okay. So let's see, where were we? We're in Minneapolis. Um, I actually started a coffee shop, shop, right? I was working at a caribou coffee there on the corner of 11th and Nicolette on downtown Minneapolis. And it was, was miserable. Um, I was overweight. I was just, I mean, I I was in a, you know, a, a, not a great relationship and, uh, I was just kind of like unhappy with my life. And that was actually a theme for, uh, you know, quite a bit of time. I ended up, um, losing a hundred pounds, uh, to, to race my first yeah, to race my first triathlon. And I did that in Catalina Island off the coast of California. I went out by myself. Yeah. I did it. I felt great. And while I was out there, I was reading Lance Armstrong's book, It's Not About the Bike. And I thought, well, there's got to be more to life than what I'm doing. And here I'm doing this triathlon thing I really loved. And it was on on the back of losing all this weight. And I'm like, I, I think I can do this. And so I came home from that trip and I started a magazine. I just- what. <laughs> yeah, I just I just started. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, looking you back. Started and, a magazine. Wow. I started a magazine. It was, now, this was twenty years ago now, and uh, it was called American Try, and it was basically the backbone of it was there was two triathlon magazines out there in the world. Oh wow! And they both kind of felt the way I described it back then was they both felt like Sports Illustrated for triathlon, and I said I wanted to make the runners world for triathlon. If you can get that analogy, where I wanted normal people. I didn't want to like, you know exalt the pros and like, look at what they're doing in their $12,000 bikes. I wanted to learn how to get faster or lose weight or understand what the tricks. And I got tr- it. So you were going for a general audience and not. Yeah, ex- of, exactly. Right. This okay. was a perfect storm. This was right when triathlon was booming. I mean, it was right when I was, when I was growing up, there was, you know, ABC wild water sports and, and you would see that. I remember that. Yeah. The that agony of the feet guy. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> And you'd hear about these people doing that crazy thing in Hawaii and you didn't know what it was. You knew it was this mm, Iron Man. Iron Man. On right, right. Yes. And something happened. Wow, some that's shift, right. Shift. It was only yeah. one of them, right? To begin with, right. there, there was, was only, only one. one. Wow. And oh there was like goodness. this weird yeah, shift where people started doing them all Everywhere. the time. And now, yeah. yeah, now Bob in accounting was doing it and everyone right. knew somebody was doing triathlon. And I'm like, there's something here. And I brought my passion of writing and design and all these things. And now my new passion of triathlon and we just got some really great, uh, really great people to work with us. And somehow, I mean, I mean, God's providence, I guess, somehow we came out of the gate as a national publication, like, like with a force. Uh, and we ended up selling to one of our competitors. I mean, we really shook people up. Um, I say we, it was pretty much the royal we. I had a lot of freelancers. Uh, and I eventually, <laughs> I, I think we had three or four people who, who, uh, who worked with me. But man, that was a trip. And so now I'm, I'm what, 27, 26, 27. And you sold a magazine. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, that sounds glorifying. It was, I sold it. Yes. I think I got five cents a subscriber. I've never wow. told this story. Okay. 
I got five cents per subscriber, and I think we had like twenty thousand subscribers. So you not can do a lot the math. Of money. Yeah. yeah, not a lot. Of yeah, money. not a lot of money, and uh, and I got a full time job out of it. So I was oh, left wow. with, yeah, I was left with about thirty k worth of debt, which I paid for the, a number of years off. Right. Um, but for you the got a job though. Yeah, and I got a job wow. as I was hired as the gear editor at Inside Triathlon. They're no longer around anymore either. Uh, they got bought up by the bigger one, which is now part of a conglomerate. So it was just kind of a, you know, magazines are kind Ecosystem of going to weird dinosaurs. Right, right, right. Yeah. And yeah, I got a job out of it. And, you know, going back to not standing still, I thought, hey, after four or five years of doing this thing and slogging through it and not having enough money to make ends meet, but having this magazine and trying to advance my career that way and 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 do good for people and grow this publication, I thought I'll be very happy to just get an assignment to review gear and sit down at my desk. And wow. that lasted, wow. yeah, that lasted about a month. And I started, and you know, you causing got itchy, right? Yeah, I got, I started, yeah, <laughs> I started causing waves and started questioning the leadership. And uh, I, I remember I was in a conference room, we we're talking about the next issue. And I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, he was the editor in chief. He was a good guy, but I think just a little misplaced. And there was like six or seven of us in the room. It's the first editorial meeting. And they're talking about what kind of letter they should make up a fake letter for the letters to the editor. And I said, I, I, I was like, what? I said, you're making up a letter? Like you don't get letters? And he's like, no. And I kind of under my breath said, no wonder we were kicking your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this, it just caused this stir. And anyway, the president ended up um, removing him and, and putting me in as the editor in chief. And I wow. did that for another, another year or so. Uh, and, until I, yeah, caused some more ruffles and then we parted, parted ways, but yeah, there was a fun ride. I learned, gosh, I learned a lot. I was thrust into that world of responsibility and corporate, you know, haggling and, you know, ethical things and, you know, legal and blah, blah, blah. And, and, uh, learned a lot, tried to have fun doing it, but gosh, that was a, you know, it's just so your, much work, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't imagine. And you know, it, it ruined it ruined the sport for me. I was, I, I went from, you know, I would race in the summertime up in Minnesota and which is, you wouldn't think it, but it's a very big uh, Minneapolis area, but Minnesota in general, very big for the sport. And wow. I went from racing 14, 15, 16 races a summer to not racing at all. And and I was like, wait, I got into this because I love the sport and now it's, it's not fun. I don't get to do it. I don't get to ride my bike. And, and uh, yeah, it was right. a great experience. We wouldn't exchange it for the world, but I don't really have anything to show for it apart from the experience. So I guess there's something to say for that. But you learned, you learned a lot. I guess that that's sort of like you learned a ton, right? I oh, mean, certainly. certainly. Right. I mean, I, I'm writing, writing a book right now. And and I still, to this day, every time I, I pull up my AP style guide or, you know, Chicago style manual, whatever, I think about all of those things I learned from the great people I worked with back then about writing and editing and right. you know, what makes a good article, what makes a good story. And, and uh, but also like owning, running a business, you know, from the ownership side and editor in chief of a magazine. That's actually, yeah. So yeah, that, like I said, it's it sounds bigger than of, it was. I mean, yeah. We're talking a very small magazine in a, in a very small market, but, but right. yeah, it was a, uh, yeah. Still though. <laughs> okay okay I, everybody was, um, everybody has to has to like you know tamper down their own achievements me included but still pretty big deal you know maybe what you're trying to get at it was like a big fish small pond kind of idea yeah i think that's well you know what's really interesting was before that i knew i wanted to be a writer and i knew i wanted to be somewhere in the outdoor active lifestyle world Right. And so, I mean, I lived in Boulder for a while and all that stuff was just kind of part of my blood. Mm. And I remember writing to men's health and to outside magazine and to men's journal. And at the time there was national geographic adventure, which is no longer around. And I remember writing them and saying, can I, can I write for you? Can I submit some stories? Can I pitch you? And they're like, kid, go away. Who the hell are you? Like, what have you written for? I'm like, well, nobody. So right. then all of a sudden I start this magazine with literally no right to be in this world and just, right. just pure gusto and, blind ambition. Right. And after I sold it, I went back to those same publications and said, Hey, can I write for you? And they went, Oh my gosh, you were the editor in chief for inside triathlon. What I did a cover story for outside go, which was their luxury lifestyle magazine. I did a couple of things for women's health and men's health and men's journal, all those magazines that pretty much showed me the curb. Now, four years later with 
no more experience than I had before just doing my own stuff. I mean, I wasn't learning from anybody else. I was making this stuff right. up as I went. Right, right. And all of a sudden they wanted me. And that, I would say that one thing taught me so much about life and how people are wired. Yes, that, it's like an aha experience of yeah, where, that was where really authority comes from, right? Basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, had, yeah. I had no more you right. You make it, you make it. You yeah. totally make I mean, authority, I, yes. I, I, I faked the, I mean, everything about what we did was, like I said, pure blind ambition. It was it was amb- ambition, don't get me wrong. And it was passion and it was real. Right. We had, right. I mean, we talked about the Iron Man. I had six-time Iron Man winner, Dave Scott, who wrote for us for a number of issues. We had- wow. We had the, you know, so the first real. American, oh, it was, we, we had great, great articles. I mean, I, th- we got letters all the time from people that we changed their lives for the articles we wrote and, and it was, you know, they lost weight or they accomplished something or well, it was great. It was fantastic. However, nothing fundamentally changed from what I knew right. uh, as a writer <laughs> right. in four years. And so then I went, okay, so this is, it's who, you know, it's what you've done. Right. It, it's a lot more of that. And that was, that's, gosh, that's a lesson that to this day stays with me and and how I lead my organization. Right. Well, I can say the same thing now. So like, I don't know why, but I ended up with self-improvement, I think as my category in iTunes. So, and I've been doing this podcast for five years. So now I have this, people assume I'm I'm authority in self-improvement. And I mean, but, but by a certain are, definition, right? I am. <laughs> yeah, I, you but are. I'm, 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 I'm relating that it feels, I feel the same, right? That, yeah. that authority that is now has been vested to me by the world. I, it was just me doing the thing, you know, just like what I, you were doing. Just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I heard you say this uh, a while ago that, you know, in, you know, there's a theme through my life where I struggled with you know, wearing a mask and not being authentic and trying to portray myself as somebody that I wasn't just to kind of get through life. Yeah. We all do that. Right. Yeah. yeah, You know, and and especially, and that's, again, I mentioned the Enneagram. I'm a big fan of, of looking into those. And, and, and as a, as a three, I am, that's my, I can be very unhealthy in that way. And so the good part of my life was me trying to come to grips with that. I think I have now, but it took a while. And, and so it was very hard for me to say, with real sincerity. Yeah, I did this and I'm proud of that because I felt like everything I did was a fraud. So right. let me, let me tell yeah. you this, that yeah, five years doing a podcast. Good for you, man. Like you are an authority. You do I have know. a right. I, I get it now. I, I'm okay with accepting it. It's just the first time it happened when somebody just sort of like granted me that, Oh, well, you're an expert in this now. It was kind of a shock, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, somebody, somebody once told me that if you, if you're in a room, you know, you don't want to have the expert, quote unquote, expert moniker. But if you're in a room full of 10 people and you happen to know more than everybody else on then you're a the expert, subject, then you're the expert. And, <laughs> right. and you, you take that to a macrocosm and you're like, oh, wow, maybe I do know something. It's 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 a hard totally. thing, uh, yeah, but you come to grips with it. And I think I can now look back at those times going, wow, I, I think and I've read some of the articles I wrote 20, 25 years ago. And I'm like, they weren't too bad, you know, like, I, I <laughs> right. Been, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't tie my shoe without help. And I couldn't, you know, I'd never do surgery or anything like that. There's so many things like I don't even have, you wouldn't want to trust me with your dog for a weekend, but <laughs> with that I can now look back and say, yeah, okay. Maybe, maybe the kid had something. So uh, well, it was, that's not so bad. Usually when I look back at things that I've done in the past, not so much this show, this show is, you know, there are maybe some cringeworthy moments, but I think, Overall, I'm pretty happy with with the me oh, that yeah. showed up for this show. Now, well, you know, what? there were two yeah, other me... shows that are gone. <laughs> those are those those cringes. I'm sure if you are like a sleuth and you want to, you know, things on the internet is like pee in the pool. It's in there. It's it doesn't you go should... away. If you yeah. really want to find those like old it. shows, you can. <laughs> Yeah, you can sure. find that's, it. Yeah, that's, that's good. But um, you, you know, it's it's interesting because you have you have such a distinct brand, right? I mean, you have a you kind of have this you know goofy name, and I know you went through a branding exercise, but it was based on you, and you know right. you've got this effervescence out of you, which is just kind of like unparalleled from anyone I know. And really, and, okay, well, that's oh nice. yeah, like I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, I love that you're just laughing, and you are you. You know, you are right. this authentic right. version. Of you. I'm not and, representing anything other than me being a goofball. Correct. Yes. Yeah, but man, like c- celebrate that. I mean, that's right. That's incredible. And I wish somebody would go back in time and tell younger Kyle, 
at 18, 19, 20, heck, even 30, you know, like, yeah, but I'm break, like, it, you know? trust me, I didn't wake up out of the womb like this. So this is the 50, almost 52 year old version of Jeff, right? So there's definitely a lot of story where I was not being me, but boy, mm-hmm. when you, when you learn that lesson and you start implementing, just be you, right? Yeah. Things yeah. get so much easier, especially relationship wise, right? I mean, 100%. So you meet people and you're just being you and they go, ooh, I don't like you. You go, okay. Right? <laughs> then yeah. you, you're skipping over all that crap that's coming that doesn't show up, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're just, instead of pretending and trying to like please them, just be you. And then if they're not going to like you, that'll happen right away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, right. I used to say, right. For a good portion of my life, I used to say that I was so polarized and that you either loved me or you hated me. Right. And I, Which is and, fine. And, That's good. Well, actually. I thought, you know, I thought it was, but I look back at it, you know, and, and I'm talking to a guy now who I embrace therapy. My, my wife is getting her master's in counseling. And so we have, I mean, I'm all in for that. And especially a lot of men right. don't spend time looking at it. And I can say now that, that even saying that was my defense mechanism, even saying that was me mm. going, oh, you don't like me? Well, I'm going to write you off because either people love me or hate me. And, and I didn't even realize at the time I was saying to that person, well, m- a lot of people love me and you don't like me. That's on you. And I didn't realize that it was something that I was doing. And no, it's mm. not all the time. I mean, some people have to have their own ownership of, you know, if they were being jerks or whatever. But right. I can honestly say now looking back, gosh, there were so many times where I was in the wrong. And I, and I passed it off as, oh, I'm just polarizing, which was hundred percent, hundred percent. So it, it's yeah. all intertwined and it's part of my story and talking about stories today. It's yeah. part of what made me who I am and what I do today. So before we forget, we'll keep going because I know there's more after the magazine and the job, sure. but yeah. let's, let's take a sidestep and talk about the Johnny Cash tour bus. Well, I don't want to miss it. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Well, this is, this might actually not be a quick one. Um, you feel free to <laughs> edit. That's okay. That. <laughs> okay. So it's 1997. I'm in right. the, I'm in the cafeteria of, uh, of the university of Colorado. I'm a non-traditional student. Cause I took like a, a couple of years off. So uh, now I'm there. I don't even know what, how old I was 21, maybe something like that. Okay. So I'm sitting there and I'm sitting with a friend of mine named Carlos and I look to the table next to me and there's these two cute girls and I mean, every good story starts with, you know, cute There's girls, cute, cute girls. Correct. Yes. Good I look story. over and um, the one who's sitting on the other side of the table that I am, you know, it's like she's kind of diagonal to me on the adjacent table, if that makes sense. She and I are locking eyes and I'm like, I'm giddy. I'm like, this girl is the bee's knees. She is amazing. <laughs> and I tell my buddy, I'm like, hey, like, hey, these girls over there, you know, whatever. And all of a sudden they come over and I'm like, oh, my gosh, they're coming. Oh, they're, coming. Oh, they're here. And I'm like, hey, you know. And uh, there's two girls and they're like, hey, what are you guys doing? What are your name? Hey, I'm Kyle. This is my friend Carlos. Oh, well, my name's Drusha and I'm Olivia. And, and and we start talking and all of a sudden it was like, hey, we want to talk to you about Jesus. And I'm like, uh, oh, the old bait and switch. Yeah. So I said I said to the, the, the cuter of the two, I said, uh, and Olivia, if she ever listened to this, she'll be upset I said that. But I look at Jerusha and I said, I said, well, I'm a, I already play for that team because uh, I'm a Christian. And I said that, you know, blatantly. I said, so what's your name? I want to get to know you. And so we start talking um, and had a wonderful time. Anyway, my friend Carlos and Olivia had this argument about like St. Thomas Aquinas and all these <laughs> things. And, you know, the proof, the ontological argument for the proof of the existence of God. And it was just this crazy thing. And here I am just fawning over this this girl who was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. And okay. <laughs> uh, we end up dating flash forward. We end up getting uh, engaged. Um, life is great. And um, she happens to be uh, Billy Graham's granddaughter. Wow. So, my goodness. Yeah. So a uh, little bit of a pedigree there. And, and I'm just madly in love. And I go down and I talk to her parents and they say, yes, we can get married. And we were supposed to get married later that summer. She was at a one year school and I was obviously at University of Colorado. And so um she went, she went home for the summer and the plan was for me to come down a couple of weeks later. And we don't know to this day what happened. Um, and I say we for a reason, I'll, you'll figure out why in a second, but I, it was 1997 email was just coming online. No one right. really, had it. Right, there's no right. really internet, there's no mobile phones, no text messaging. It's a landline system. I'm in college. So I'm very transient. I'm leaving my, my home for the, for the semester. And I, she drove away to go home knowing I'm supposed to come after her in a couple of weeks and I never saw her again. 
just never, never saw her again. 20, 21 years go by without me saying so a word. Say to, her name again, <laughs> just so you can email her. <laughs> oh, we're, we're, mar- we're married today. Oh, wow. Okay. All Next right. wonderful children. She's still the love of my life. Oh, great. Um, so you never saw her but, again until you did. Okay, good. But, so that's a different story. <laughs> okay. But in that moment, when you thought when you she lost left, her, you thought, you I lost thought I lost her. and I was right. devastated. Miserable. Yeah. I was devastated. And yeah, devastated is the word. And uh, if I think about it too much, not in a story context, but physically, I will just lose it because I remember palpably how much that hurt. So oh. I'm just laying on my floor, just crying in my dorm room. Just it was a mess. And, you know, could not, and we didn't have common friends because she went to another college. Remember, she went to this one year Bible school that was, you know, right. away, away from, so we didn't, I didn't know anybody who knew her. So there was literally no way to contact her. And because her mother and father, her mother was Billy Graham's eldest, um, uh, they were unpublished. So there's no way to even find her, right? In the right. phone book. They're famous. So they're sort of like, yeah, yeah. Awesome. unreachable, right? Really, really unreachable. So wow. in my desperation, um, I'm crying on the floor and uh, my buddy says, Hey, uh, you know, I know that's something that'll get you, you know, excited. Uh, Let's go see Johnny Cash. He's coming to the Boulder theater. I'll never forget this June 14th, 1997. And I'm like, okay. And then I remembered that Johnny Cash and Billy Graham were good buddies. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is is my chance. So we go to the show and I, oh, oh, I call, I call the manager ahead of time and I leave this message and his manager, they're all at the time, I think in the late sixties, seventies years old or something. And so same manager he had his whole life. And he was completely just a really sweet guy. And uh, he goes, yeah, come to the show, come find me and we'll see if we can make something work. So I go down to the side of the curtain, the Boulder theater is this really old theater and it kind of right off the Pearl street mall. And it's, it's this beautiful old theater, but you can walk down the right-hand side of the stage and walk right into the backstage. And that's where the security is. So I walked back and I asked for the guy and he comes up and he goes, uh, Mr. Cash, we'll see you now. And because we're at altitude, he only sang a couple songs and then right. needed to get oxygen. And so June <gasps> came up. Wow. They were both alive. So June came up and sang and he was in his tour bus getting oxygen. He's like, now's your chance. So I go get my buddy who's a massive Johnny Cash fan. And I said, now's the time to go meet this guy. And he didn't believe me. And I'm like, come right now. This is a chance of a lifetime. lifetime. And we go back and I'll tell you, shook his hand on his tour bus he said, I'm John. How are you? I hear you're, you're Jerusalem's fiance. And I was so nervous. And so like, I, I didn't even know. I mean, the first celebrity I'd met and it's Johnny Cash and my, my buddy was fawning. Did he over have his- those like giant hands that were all like, yeah, like hands, sandpaper? Hands the size of the baseball mitt. Like this right. guy yeah, yeah. was built like Joe Montana. I didn't know he was that big. Like he was. Yeah, he's huge. And- <laughs> super sweet guy. And he's, and, and uh, never forget it because he was, he had one of those little like um, masks that the oxygen goes right like, uh, on an airplane. Right. And so he's taking some oxygen breaths and then moving the mask and saying a couple words. And he was talking about Jerusha and how much he, he loves her and the family. And wow. I never got out that I was so embarrassed at that point. Like, how do I say, Oh, by the way, I don't know where lost touch, you know, and do you have her was, number. <laughs> yeah. Which I should have done. I should have done looking back. I should have done that. So, uh, yeah, so that was my time. I was probably seven or eight minutes on his tour bus and sweetest guy, uh, in the world. And I'm in my office right now. And the only two posters I have on the wall is one of Billy Graham and one of Johnny cash. So, uh, very meaningful to me. Gotcha. Perfect. So yeah. how did it, work out how did you find your wife now you, you have to finish the story well <laughs> that would, that you would be a great time to break this into two episodes <laughs> maybe uh, <laughs> next, uh, so uh, anyway i got i got married and i had some children and and uh was i was just wasn't happy i didn't you know and, and as we alluded to if you don't know yourself if you don't come to terms with yourself you don't have the right to you know really invest in other people and and it's all based on nonsense really. And so, um, yeah, I just moved on with my life and I, and I kind of filled my void of hurt and I walked away from my faith uh, as, because I, I kind of blamed God for the loss of this woman who just, I, I mean, loved to death and, uh, just was so sad that I, you know, I, I made a bunch of bad mistakes and anyone who took me and, and showed me any attention or any love, I was like, okay, I'm in, you know? And so, wow. um, I had a couple kids and, you know, life goes on and we move a few times and the kids are growing up and, and, uh, and I just, I was, no one knew it. Um, but I was just, I got 
more and more sad as the years went on. And I kept investing in stuff and work and I ended up building a really great corporate career. And I was uh, the head of, I was the senior vice president of e-commerce and all digital, which included marketing and online and all that stuff right. for Dr. Right. For Dr. Martin's footwear. I was the youngest on the, wow. on the team, uh, on the leadership team. I answered directly to the CEO. I was the only American and, you know, I was flying first class everywhere. And I just, I mean, I hated myself and it was just constantly feeling that, you know, I, I have to keep doing things. That's just kind of in my nature. Right. And I kept trying to do life and I kept, you know, failing at it and, you know, okay, that will make me feel better. This will make me feel better. I, I, you know, I, I was still cycling, still doing running events, not so much triathlon. And I, I couldn't bear to be around my wife. I, I just, I didn't want, not, not so much because of her and we didn't really, I don't think we ever were in love. Uh, I think she would tell you that too, but mm. it was because I just, I couldn't be alone with people because I was anything I was, that wasn't distracting me from my sadness. Um, right. And I didn't seek help and I, and not until it was very, very late in the game and, and uh, try to take my life one day and just, you know, <clears throat> I don't want to. Been there, done that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just sad time. And I didn't have anyone to talk to because all of my relationships were based on, you know, a fake uh, persona. So. Right. I'm sad. I ended up losing my job because they wanted me to move to London and uh, I, you know, I didn't want to move to London and they were about to, you know, build more kind of hire a new CEO. And, and so it was just better to cut ties. I mean, my travel budget was more than my salary. So they were like, let's just, you can save money. And so we parted ways uh, the same week that I actually separated from my wife and moved out. Wow. And so now I'm just like, talk about a beer. That's like two beers at once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was but this, for me, this was probably my biggest veer, if you want. Yeah, you for sure. Would. Yeah. And I was forced to live with myself. Now I'm alone in a studio, like a modern, so it was all, like, imagine, like, modern cement. The walls were cement, like, that kind of, like, modern mm. middle, like, this this newer building. And I'm in this studio with literally a bike on a rack, my bed and a TV, and that's it, and myself. And that was, like, a recipe for disaster. Yeah. So I was super sad. And um, it was actually my ex-wife who said, why don't you go to Hawaii? Because, uh, you know, I li we lived in Portland. And so it was a very quick trip and it was right. cheap because, you yep. know, you could just hop over there. And I went to Hawaii to ride my bike for two weeks. And I'll tell you something, Jeff. Uh, I That was the beginning of this new life. I said, I am going, I don't know why I did this, but I said, I don't know if there's a God or a universe or whoever I'm speaking to, but I'm going to be open to whatever to whatever is out there. I'm just gonna be open to life. I'm gonna not close myself off. I'm gonna be myself, whatever that meant. Right. I took, I took a Brene Brown book with me. I read Daring Greatly. Awesome. And, I love her. And I'm out there and I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, I'm like on the beach reading a book, crying to myself by myself in Hawaii. I was like the most pathetic, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can share with that because I, my suicide attempt happened while I was stationed in Hawaii. So it, oh it feels it, you feel guilty because everybody's having such a good time and the weather's so nice and you're depressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll tell you. Well, first of all, listen, I'm glad you're with us. So yeah. that's amazing. And, and I'm, I'm glad you seem uh, too. <laughs> genuinely an exciting person. So that's awesome. Um, so I'm out there and I'm riding my bike every day and I put like 200, 300 miles in, in a couple of weeks and you know, rode everywhere. And turns out my old cycling coach was out there at the same time. And I rode with him. And, but one of the things that was really cool was I said, I'm going to say yes to any opportunity. It was kind of like that Jim Carrey. Yeah, I yes, saw that movie. Yes, man. Not, not quite that, yeah, you know, I'm agreeable, James. but <laughs> right. Um, so I get to, uh, I, you know, I get to the Uber driver and she's older Hawaiian woman. She goes, you want to sit up front? I said, yeah, yeah, sure. So we're driving. She goes, are you in a rush? And I, and I'm not, I wasn't really. She goes, would you want to stop for coffee? And I'm like, okay. So we stopped for coffee. I mean, I'm, I would never do that in my life. I would have dismissed this person as like, lady, I don't oh, know you. Don't. Don't. Right. <laughs> I don't know you. I get to hear her story and she's a Christian. And she tells me this wonderful story of her life. And while she's driving me to, uh, to go pick up my rental car and then, you know, because I'm by myself, I felt, I felt guilty taking up a table eating dinner. So I'd eat at the bar a lot. So you're this, you know, a lone guy reading a Brene Brown book at the bar eating sushi. People ask questions. And so bartender comes over and goes, you, you okay, man? I go, yeah, I'm just out here by myself. He's like, who comes to Hawaii by himself? I said, I'm riding my bike, whatever. He's like, if you're not doing anything tonight, we're having a dinner party with some locals. If you want to join us. I'm like, yes. And 
yes. we get there and I'm like, <laughs> that's a good, I'm like, yeah, it was just kind of crazy time after time after time. It was these people and all of them. Well, I don't know what you believe if, if you're, yeah, it doesn't matter to me. I love all types of people, but every single person happened to be a Christian. And so Perfect. I was just like, this is weird. Like, this is like, even I was like, okay, this is, come on. Someone's punking me someplace. Right. Something um, spooky is going on here. Yeah. And so it's like the fifth or sixth day and I'm, you know, I'm sad. I'm away from my children. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have nothing to return to. And the, and I was there for two weeks, I think somewhere a little bit more. And the, this was right after there was that weird, I don't even remember this. There was that weird missile scare in Hawaii. And so, missile uh, scare in Hawaii. What, yeah, year, this, what year was this? No, this is January of 2018. So, hmm. uh, there was like somebody mistyped like a text message, like it was a drill, and they actually thought that the islands were under attack by missiles. And turned out very quickly, they realized it was it was just it was a false alarm, and something got out to everybody. It wasn't supposed to happen. And so the following week, all these people who left early or whatever happened, it was just booked. The place was booked solid. And so the only place I could get for that long of a stretch, unless I wanted to like hotel room hop over two and a half weeks, right. was was an Airbnb room. And I've never done that. I always thought that was weird. So I'm staying in this cute little Canadian retired couple's like bet bedroom, spare bedroom in this guest, I mean, not in a guest house, in a condo. So very small quarters. Right. And they're Every there morning. with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I and I was out. All, I was out all day, either you right, know, run, right. running or riding my bike. And and but in the morning, she'd always, gosh, I can't remember her name. Um, but every morning they'd make me fresh local Kona coffee wow. and sliced fresh pineapple. And I walk out one day, and uh, uh, I I want to make sure I don't I don't like uh, lose it emotionally on your show. But I walk out one day, and she says to me, um, "Are you okay?" And I said, yeah, no, I'm great. And she looked at me and she said, no, seriously, uh, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not. I said, I don't know what's going on right now. And I'm just, I'm lost. And uh, anyway, she said, um, she said, well, I thought so. And she said, uh, my husband and I have been praying for you since we've been here and we're Christians. And I'm like, oh, for Pete's sakes, like this is. It just keeps happening. It just, just kept happening. Yes. And, <laughs> and, so, and, and I don't want to bore people who, who know, who don't, subscribe to this, you know, line of reasoning, but, uh, flash forward, this kept happening over and over and over again. And I'm starting to just go like, Oh, this is like, now I'm panicking. Like, okay, there is a God and he he's chasing me. Like, this is weird. <laughs> I understand so, uh, that feeling. I, I yes, I can relate. Yeah. My last day. And, uh, it's my last day and I'm sitting in a bar in Paia, which is on the North shore. It's not too far from Kahului, which is where the airport is. And I've already packed my bike up and everything. And I wanted to have one last IPA at this little bar in town and a little like small margarita pizza. So it was like a personal pizza and a, and a beer. And I'm sitting at the bar again and I, and I prop my phone up. I, I turn on CNN and I'm just watching the news and, and I have on my phone, uh, cause I had the app and I look up to like the TVs or something. I look up, you know, to what's in the room and I hear this voice and it's a voice that I would never forget in a million years. And I look down at the phone and it's, it's Jerusha on CNN. What? And uh, I hadn't seen her or talked to her or reached out to her. Of course she was my what if girl. So along the way, you know, in life, you know, when Facebook came out or whatever, and Google became a thing, like I would of course look her up all, all the time. And okay. She always seemed happy and, you know, and, and I, you know, I knew like, okay, well, she's never going to get divorced. She's Billy Graham's granddaughter, you know, that right. doesn't. Happen. And so I just kind of like chalked it up as like my fault. I just never chased her. I should have followed her. And so um, I texted her. She said something really amazing. It was during, um, it was during something Trump did that was really weird. And, uh, and she came out and said something on, on the news and I was just really proud of her. And so I, I found now, I, now I knew her married last name, which I never knew. So I, I found her on Facebook Messenger and I sent her a note and I said, I don't know if you remember me, but I'll tell you that what I just saw you do in a minute and a half on the news was amazing. And I'm just really proud that I got to know you at, you know, for a little bit of my life. And I'm proud of the woman you've become. And that was it. I didn't think anything of it. I didn't, wasn't trying to, you know, I was sad that I wasn't with her, but I was happy that I saw her. It was just kind of a weird emotional thing. And of course, of course it capped off this weird two and a half weeks of feeling I've been chased. And she basically wrote me back and I mean, immediately. And she said, you know, that's insulting that you think I wouldn't remember you. Like I've been looking for you for 20 years. And, what? um, wow. yeah. And, um, okay. flash forward where 
we've basically been together every day since. Um, we, yeah, we, sh- we share a wonderful blended family where all the siblings just love each other. It's amazing. Um, we have a great life here in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, and she actually just, she just walked into the office. She's just walking by talking to her brother who works for me. Um, and, uh, she's still as gorgeous today as she was when I first laid eyes on her. So wow. it's been a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah, I owe my that, life. That should be a book in and of itself. I hope you're writing that, that into the book. If you're writing. Yeah. That. I mean, I'd love to. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. So anyway, I, I, and I wouldn't blame you if you cut most of this stuff out because no, not I know. at all. No way. That's what the show is. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that's the that's the long johnny cash story yeah i love it it's that's perfect so yeah. uh we have to wrap up pretty quick but before we wrap up we'll we'll talk about the brain um but let's uh let's talk a little bit about how did you get into ipa because that's always a fun story uh well uh, yeah that's a short story for me is that okay. i just <laughs> love it I love that taste. I love the bitter taste. And and there's something about that hoppiness that I love. And being in Portland for six years, I just really, I just okay. really can't love Portland that style. Portland for six years will do it because yeah, Portland is sure. a huge IPA city. Yeah. You could literally drink any, you could drink a different beer every day and not go through all of them in a year. And and, and they're all really good too. They're, oh, all, they're amazing. all really yeah. good. And they have, you know, one of the, one of my favorite, well, actually when I was still living in Boulder, Denver um, years before, uh, it was Deschutes Brewing, which happens to be out of Bend, Oregon, and yep. Deschutes came out with something called Hop Trip, and yes. it was the yeah, it, was, it was it was in the bomber bottle, and you could only get it right after. Hey, baby, thank you. Um, you could only get it right after the uh, the, the hop harvest in October, oh, wow. and it was it was a celebration of that. Yeah, it was a celebration of going to the get the hops, and they'd come back and they'd make one. It was a fresh hop. I mean, you, you hear fresh hop IPAs all the time, mm. but it was one. And I fell in love with that. You'd only get, I would buy cases of it and I could only, yeah. you'd only have that time of year. And so when I finally moved to Oregon, um, just shoots brewing was, there's obviously one in Ben, but they put one in Portland. And I just started finding like all these other 10 barrels up there. And I can't remember some of the other names, uh, but some really great um, brew pubs and breweries just love it, man. It's just so good. So, so my my church of IPA was Stone. <laughs> because, Stone IPA, fantastic. Well, I I could drive. It was kind of a long drive, but I could drive to the the brewery when I lived in Southern California. Oh wow, yeah, that would be dangerous. That'd be dangerous. It's amazing. So I think they have two brew pubs now. Um, one's like in the I can't remember. It's like a small town, but sort of like on the way to San Diego. Okay. And then there's another one that's like a little bit easier to get to. I think it's in San Diego now. But anyway, I went to both a lot, right? And they would have like these uh, small batches that would be just experimental. So you mm-hmm. could go in there and get like, um, oh, what was a good example of a nice experiment? Something like... Um, uh, sublimely self-righteous with jalapeno <laughs> or habanero or something, you know, just something wow. wacky shit that they would just like throw together and never what? sell it, you know, but they would just be like playing with it. There's one out of San Diego. Where are you now? I'm in Las Vegas now, but I moved here in 2017. So, so what is it? In Torrance. Is it Sculpin in San Diego? Is that the one that's down there? Sculpin is awesome. They yeah. make this. We make that one that's like it's, I don't know if it's jalapeno, but it's like it's like a spicy one. Which man, that's good too. They they make some they great. They make a lot of really nice beers, a lot yeah. of nice IPAs. I don't you know, and remember I, and I, the spicy one either, <laughs> but I think I've had it. I've tried it. I think it was like jalapeno in there. But let me let me give a quick shout out to Greenville because when I first moved here, I was I have to be honest, I was disappointed. I was so spoiled in Portland, right? And I came here, and you know everyone's drinking Bud Light Lime in the summer, and we have had. An amazing influx of breweries here, and um, gosh, it's just a it's a beautiful place to live. But now it's an even better place to live because you get to have some great beers. So I would say there's some beers here that rival some of the one, best ones I've had in Portland. You wouldn't and believe I wouldn't, it. I wouldn't but have said that three years ago, there's uh, there's really good IPA and local breweries in Vegas too. Really, quite a few. Yeah, I was surprised. Um, I can't. I think there's one called uh, Tanea. It's either Tanea or Tanaya. I can, but it's they make a really nice IPA. Um, wow. I don't, I'm not sure if you can get it out outside of the Vegas Valley or not, but it's delicious. 
There's Four Peaks. I think they're local to Nevada. I don't know if they're in Vegas or not. But yeah, there's uh, there's there's some some nice local IPAs around here that I awesome. I, I indulge in a, as I can. Well, this has been a blast, Kyle. Thank you so much. So as we wrap up, let's talk about thebrandleader.com and how people can best get in touch with Kyle Duford. You know, um, we're happy to offer uh, any assistance we can for brands, businesses. If you're thinking about rebranding, if you have design questions, uh, we've got a great downloadable uh, kind of free book. Uh, It's called The the ultimate guide to rebranding. I'm really proud of that. Uh, Jeff, the CEO and I, and actually some other folks here contributed to it. We just basically talk about what does it even mean? You know, why do you need brand guidelines and you know, what a brand is more than a logo and how much these things cost, all that sort of thing. And I just love talking about it. And if it's not me, somebody else here could. So if you have any questions on branding, design, um, you know, brand positioning, brand architecture, any of that stuff, even if it's confusing, if you can't find it on our website, we'd be happy to, to chat with you. It's just the brandleader.com. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kyle. This has been a blast. Maybe come back six months, a year down the road. We'll get, cause you're really good at telling those stories. And I think there's oh, more. <laughs> That's very kind of you. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, Kyle. A lot of fun. So thanks, Jeff. Really appreciate it. All right. Have a good one. All right, you as well. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double E R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer. Vroom Vroom Veer.